Hello, welcome back to the Roguelike Celebration. Um, I'm Noah Swartz. I'm going to be doing MC duty for the rest of the evening. Um, our next speaker is Philip Daigle. Uh, Philip is a 14 year veteran of the games industry. Uh, formerly, he was a studio director at Beamdog, and now he is a senior design producer at Improbable Canada. Uh, Philip's talk is called Roguescape feeling around in the dark. So without further ado, here's Philip. Hey folks, thank you for uh, joining me. I'm just gonna share my screen here. All right, just get set up. Okay, so assuming that you guys can see that, we are ready to go. So hello, I hope you're enjoying the roguelike celebration so far. And thank you for coming to see my talk. So I'm Phil Daigle. Uh, this is my work history. I've been in the industry for many, many years, starting as a hobbyist before then. Uh, I worked on Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale, Planescape Torments, Axis and Allies, uh, lots and lots of D&D and digital board game experiences at Beamdog. And we'll come back to that later. I worked on first-person shooters, real-time strategy, turn-based games, MMOs. Um, and in those games, I've worked on system design, writing, scheduling, map design, pitching to publishers, VO, creative direction, mocap. If it's a task in the industry, I've probably dipped a toe into it, uh, unless those tasks were related to programming or art. Uh, if anyone out there is a CAPTCHA, I'd like you to know that I am, in fact, a human who has interests. And you can ask me about any of these uh, after the presentation, if you desire. So a brief aside about Baldur's Gate. Uh, this is a Dungeons & Dragons game. It's real time with pausing. You control a party of characters with a bunch of detailed stats and equipment, and you guide them through a bunch of combat and narrative scenarios. And I worked on the enhanced editions of those games, which started showing up in uh, 2010. So the thing you need to remember is Baldur's Gate is a real-time strategy game with you know some persistence. Um, and if you want me to say something really controversial, Baldur's Gate and The Sims are basically the same game. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3 is coming out soon. I believe it's entering early access, uh, middle of this month, so go check it out. I did not work on it, but it looks really, really cool. All right, so enough about my background. This is what you wanted to see. So I'm going to tell you about my journey in building a roguelike and how I tackled some of the obstacles that I faced based on my skill set and how you can do the same. Um, you don't need to be an experienced programmer. You don't need to be an experienced artist. You don't need to be smart, but you do have to show up and put in the effort. That's the important bit. Although I will say that being smart is very, very beneficial. And if you have that option, uh, I would take it. And last, I'm going to try to convey to you that you should try making a game that's just for you. So what did I make? Uh, I made a game called Rogue's Gate, which is my love letter to 90s PC gaming. Uh, I made a lot of classic game dev mistakes while I was working on this game, sometimes uh, because I wasn't paying enough attention, and sometimes intentionally because I wanted to gaze into the dark abyss of these cursed design problems for myself and really understand why they're so intractable and so frustrating to deal with. I'm also still not done. Uh, the game is still getting worked on. Uh, you know, that last 20% is always the hardest, I'm sure you've heard. But I will finish it because I am driven forward by an unstoppable force, which is spite. Uh, a coworker of mine once jokingly suggested that I would never finish the game. And so I must prove them wrong at all costs. So let's take a look at the actual game itself. Uh, so the game is a real-time strategy game. You start by creating your own character. You choose a race and a class and a starting party. So the starting party will determine your starting companions, the equipment that you have, and a little bit of a narrative nudge in a, in a particular direction. So it's kind of like different flavors or different challenges for starting the game. So once you're actually in the game, it's all about sort of going through this overworld, battling creatures, talking to NPCs, getting better equipment for your party, and that sort of thing. You have to travel to six different towers on this world map. Uh, at the top of each tower is an item of power. You bring it back down to, uh, or sorry, you bring all six of them back down to the Shrine of Ascension, and off you go, you win the game. Conceptually, it's very similar to NetHack and how you go down, get the Amulet of Yendor, and come back up. Um, so everything in this game, uh, I wrote myself. Every, every piece of code is me. The art is taken from a variety of sources that I'll show you in, uh, very, very soon. 
But uh, the enemies have unique behaviors. They'll run different AI scripts. They'll have different actions. They'll cast spells. They'll try and heal their allies, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm very, very proud of, you know, the, the shape that the game has taken. And, you know, it's a lot of fun for me to play. And that, that's what was important to me is making something for me to enjoy. So a little bit more detail about the game itself. So uh, you can create your character in the top left there. These are screenshots showcasing, you know, some combat, exploring the overworld. This is the equipment uh, management screen. This is the world map that gets generated procedurally every time you play the game. Uh, I don't know if you can tell which one of these art assets I created uh, by hand. If you guess the graphic for the uh, floors here, that is correct. That is the extent of my artistic skill, which is amazing when you see the rest of the game, and I will explain why soon. This is an event uh, on the top left. You get a variety of options based on different things that happen in the game. There's different biomes that have different impacts on gameplay. There's a whole merchant store system. And no uh, roguelike would be complete if it didn't have dungeons. So there you go on the bottom right. So why did I make Baldur's Gate, or sorry, Rogue's Gate? You can guess where the name came from now. Um, roguelikes are rad. I think that they're very pure uh, expressions of gameplay, and I find them really, really interesting. The added tension and threats when you know your characters can die permanently, forever, I think adds uh, a lot to a game, and I really, really like that. So I wanted my game to be a roguelike. I wanted to learn how to program, um, and I wanted to learn more than just, you know, making Snake in Python or something like that. I wanted to try doing something a little more extensive than that, because I knew that, you know, uh, I, I would bounce off of learning programming if it was something that simple. Um, and last, I wanted to be a dictator. You know, group projects are fantastic, they're great, but sometimes you want to make arbitrary decisions and not have to explain them. And guess what? A lot of the decisions I made were pretty arbitrary. Uh, some guiding principles that I kept in mind, uh, make something for your 12-year-old self. So I wanted to capture that 90s PC gaming feel. It was where I grew up, and it's where I have a lot of fond memories. Um, can I procedurally generate Baldur's Gate, which is a very narrative-heavy uh, RPG, but when you really look at the components of the game and how they come together, you can see a way that it could be procedurally generated. That's what I wanted to attempt. And I wanted to keep it short, so an inspirational game of mine is FTL, which you can play a complete experience in an hour and a half. And I think that's wonderful. So I know a lot of you in the audience are experienced developers, and you're probably not terribly uh, blown away by anything you've seen in terms of complexity. But I know that a lot of you in the audience are not programmers or game developers who might be thinking, wow, are you kidding me? This seems monstrously complex. There's programming, art, audio, lore, gameplay. Like, this is nuts. Um, but it's important to realize, like, when I sat down to do this, I was very much of the same mindset. I did not think that I could do this. I learned some very limited web programming in 1999, and believe it or not, things have changed since then. Uh, if you sat me down in front of a terminal with an install of Python and told me, hey, make some snake, I, I would say, snope, can't do it. I don't know how to do that. Um, so I, I would have started to sweat and cry. But today, these days, there's tools and resources that you can use to elevate your capabilities. When I first started in game dev, the engines that we have available today just weren't there. If you showed someone when I started what you're capable of doing with the tools that are available today, they would have started to vomit with rage. It would have been hilarious to see their brains break. So let's break down how I actually accomplished all this. So the first thing that I had to tackle was programming. Um, and there's a lot of different avenues to get into programming. Uh, Python is probably a fantastic way to learn programming, but um, it's also kind of slow to see the results that I wanted to see. I'm an impatient child, and I wanted to do more than just ASCII art for my first thing out. Um, I didn't think that I could really innovate in the ASCII art space, and I wanted to, you know, push some pixels around. So Python didn't really jump out at me. Uh, and then, of course, C, Go, Java, like, they're fantastic languages. They're very, very powerful, but the barrier to entry is, is very, very high. So, all right, let's look at Unity and Unreal. Um, they're fantastic engines. They do amazing things in both 2D and 3D. I've used both of them. They're fantastic. But there's a lot of overhead associated with them. I'm not terribly good at 3D. And, you know, they also hold your hands in ways that perhaps I didn't want them to hold my hand. I wanted some help, but I didn't want too much help. I wanted kind of that sweet spot of accelerated development while still having some learning and challenge ahead of me. So as luck would have it, at uh, GDC 2017, I ended up with a free copy of Game Maker Studio 2, um, which is a fantastic 2D engine. 
So uh, this is an engine by YoYo Games. It's been in development for years and years. The Game Maker platform is actually uh, quite old and has a lot of developers on it. But this is actually a kind of a brand new iteration of their core technology and their IDE. So this is all still pretty new stuff. Um, the engine does a lot of heavy lifting for you if you're starting out with programming, but it still has an elaborate programming language in it. Um, it handles all your assets, your memory management, and it's got fantastic 2D sprite tools, and there's a lot of documentation. So this seemed like it would handle all of the stuff that I wanted to accelerate. Um, but there's some caveats there. It's not free. It costs money, and you know, uh, a lot of the documentation you'll find out there is not necessarily for this version of Game Maker. Um, now that I know more about the game that I made and what my needs are and I have more programming capability, I would probably go back and use Godot if I were starting from scratch. But Game Maker Studio 2 worked. It worked for me. It's great. And I have no plans to move away from it in the future for this game. So I decided, uh, all right, I'm going to learn some programming through the medium of Game Maker. Uh, but it does have some pros and cons. So I learned more about programming, uh, or I know more about programming now than I did when I first started this, this whole journey. So a lot of the deficiencies that the engine has weren't things that I really knew about or understood or understood why they would be deficiencies, but now I do. So one example, uh, if you're willing to put up with some jargon, is uh, the concept of a struct in code. That is not something that uh, Game Maker language could do when I first started out, and I didn't really miss it because I didn't know about it. But had I been using a more elaborate programming language, I probably would have known about it and it would have been very, very useful. Uh, as an aside, it does have that now. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of great features that make it behave like a modern language. But at the time, it didn't. So if you wanted to do something like try catch to, to catch debugging issues, sorry, that's that's not part of the thing. And it also meant that I couldn't use common roguelike tools like libtcod or pygame or anything like that. So everything that I wanted, I had to make myself for the most part which was good because that was kind of the goal, is learn programming. Um, for me, programming has always been a very, very hard thing to learn. I've bounced off of learning programming many, many times. And here's a hot take. Programming is hard, and it kind of sucks. There's a bunch of like angry, uh, esoteric math symbols screaming at you, a bunch of jargon from the 1970s that you don't understand. So, you know, it's not for the faint of heart if you're going into it for the first time. And for me, the more abstract a problem was, the harder it was for me to stay engaged. So what was key for me staying involved was seeing like little bits of progress that were very, very visible. And Game Maker Studio 2 is a very, very good engine for that in that, yes, there, it lets you program some things, but it also does a lot of handholding for you. So you're not getting bogged down with like, how do I rotate a sprite? Well, there's just a function that does that, and you can go off and have more fun that way. Um, some pieces of advice that I can give for staying engaged. Uh, it's not the tool, it's you. 99% uh, of the time when I was like, well, clearly the engine is broken and I am not at fault here. I am God's blessed child who can do no wrong. No, you're wrong. You're probably not reading the error messages properly. You're, you're not probably uh, looking at them carefully enough. So don't get frustrated with your tools. Uh, good enough is good enough, keep going. So what I mean by that is you can pigeonhole yourself real hard on some features like pathfinding, for instance, for essentially an infinite amount of time. And you know you will always make progress, but that is an infinite problem that you can spend forever on. So it's important to develop the skill of like learning when you can put something down and focus on another aspect of the game you want to build. Um, for me, it was always important to have like two or three different things that I could switch back and forth to at any given time once I felt like I'd gotten enough progress in a specific feature that any more was going to be a bit of a grind. Uh, programmers are usually going to tell you if you make a change, compile, and then look at what changed, that's kind of a bad practice because you should probably know about the things that you're changing and not just doing blind guessing. That's true. That's great advice. But when you're starting programming, when you're first learning how to do a lot of these things, that's kind of the only way you're going to figure out how a lot of these functions work is change one variable. Oh, that's what that thing does with that. Now I understand. So. It's good advice, but when you're just starting out, don't don't feel afraid to just like poke something, tinker with it, see what happens. Um, and when you're staying uh, engaged, you're gonna work on some stuff that doesn't get used. You're gonna end up making things that get tossed out. That's totally fine. That was the point of this whole exercise is understanding why something does or doesn't. Uh, so art, this is another huge obstacle for a lot of people. And a lot of people just end up not trying to tackle with it because it's very, very frustrating to deal with. You can't draw. 
I can't draw. I can't do 3D modeling. I'm terrible at those things. I can edit things that already exist, uh, which is not a particularly elite skill set. But what I do know is that the open source community, the public domain community, the Creative Commons community has an insane amount of awesome resources and assets available for you to use. And what I discovered is that like a lot of the time, you'll find a piece of art that's almost what you need and another piece of art that's almost what you need. And you can kind of kit bash those things together to make something that looks bespoke and custom to your game. Uh, kit bashing is a term that came out of like old sci-fi TV shows where they would take a model train kit and a model airplane kit and just plunge a bunch of parts together to make something new. And you can do the same thing with open source free assets out there and you get amazing results. Another thing I learned is that if you are willing to spend even a small amount of money, you can get some amazing things for very, very cheap. Uh, one guy made an entire tile set that kind of apes the Chrono Trigger style um, and it's available for just a few dollars and immediately it makes your project look amazing. While I was working on this, opengameart.org was probably my most visited website throughout the entire uh, development cycle because they have thousands and thousands and thousands of, of assets of all kinds. You're probably familiar with this uh, graphic in the center here, the uh, stone soup tile set, I believe that was. Um, and it, alongside that, there are thousands and thousands of fantastic assets that are probably going to be relevant to your game. Uh, there's also stuff like Kenny.nl is a person that makes amazing assets for free, just gives them away. They make asset creation tools so that you can make whatever you need. Um, there's just a lot of stuff available on this site, and I encourage you to go check it out. Um, one thing I will suggest, though, is make sure you're keeping track of your licenses and your credits, um, because there's nothing worse than, you know, six months down the line, trying to step through your project and be like, mm, where did I get that graphic? Okay, where did I get that one? What's this one? Even if you think you're just goofing off of something, try to keep track of, of the credits file because it will be handy in the future. Um, one thing I do want to point out, though, the Liberated Pixel Cup on Open Game Art. Holy crap, this thing is amazing. So there's hundreds of people contributing to this cross-compatible um, pixel art uh, archive, essentially, with characters, tile sets, items, equipment, everything. And it all works together, and it's all open source, and it's available for you to use. So there's a lot of great stuff out there for absolutely free, and I was shocked at the stuff that you could build uh, just based off of the stuff on that site. Um, so you may have noticed that uh, Rogue's Gate has a very strong resemblance to a game called Warcraft 2. So a brief aside, um, Strategist is an open source re-implementation of Warcraft 2. Uh, and I was kind of hanging around with the development team for that game about 20 years ago. And it had gotten to the point where it was so good that you could actually extract the data from a Warcraft 2 installed disk and just start playing Warcraft 2 inside of this open source engine. Um, so Blizzard did not like that, believe it or not, especially because it was originally called FreeCraft. So when you name your game FreeCraft and it allows you to extract Warcraft 2 data files and play an open source version of that commercial game, uh, companies take, uh, take exception to that. So I'm not surprised that they came down with a cease and desist and forced us to change the name. So I had made some campaigns and some maps, but I mostly just idled in the IRC channel with all the other developers. And I was familiar with how this engine arranged its sprites and whatnot. So I was pretty curious to see if there was anything out there that I could use. And as luck would have it, I found Warm Sun, which is this amazing game that's available on Steam. It's an RTS, you can go play it right now. And it takes the strategist engine and it implements an all new RTS with all custom open source art by this amazing artist named Jin. And it's fantastic, go check it out. But the important thing was that it had amazing licenses. So I looked at this and I thought, wow, this has everything that I need that I would want to use in making a roguelike, so why don't I adopt this? Uh, another cool thing was that all the sprites were broken down by uh, layers, so I could make new sprites just by stacking them together. So it was kind of a mother load in terms of uh, developing an art style for your game. Uh, and as you may have noticed, the game is 16 by 9, so we're going to pretend that this is a love letter to an alternate 90s where everybody had monitors like John Carmack. All right, so what about audio? Well, the lucky thing here is that open source strikes again. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of great pieces of music, voice files, little UI sounds, everything that you would possibly need available in the open source community. And you know, instantly you can elevate the presentation of your game and 
a very, very easy way. Audio is also a really, really fantastic place to bring a friend in. Um, it's something that's easy to collaborate on. So a friend of mine actually wanted to learn about making video game music. And so we both decided, okay, well, I'll make the game. You can make the music. And we both benefited by, you know, learning all about the process. Um, the one thing that I will say as a piece of advice is try not to bring that friend in a little early because it's very frustrating for a musician to try and make music for a rapidly moving target that oscillates in one week from a sci-fi ship shooter to a Baldur's Gate uh, clone. All right, so lore. Uh, I got some news for you folks. All lore is made up and there are no wrong answers. You can write whatever the heck you want. Um, I'm, I'm a bit softer on lore. To me, lore should give rise to interesting gameplay scenarios. I am always interested in writing something that's actually relevant to the game that you're playing. Um, you know, I think, I think lore is, is where you can get as wild as you want because there's no wrong answers. Write whatever you feel is cool, and if people are into it, they're into it. If you are writing stuff that you think might appeal to someone somewhere, but you're pretty soft on it, it it's going to show. So my advice is, you know, write what's relevant to you and what's relevant to the game. And, you know, the people will tell you if they like it or not. And if they don't, forget it. What do they know? All right, design. So when I say feeling around in the dark, I mean, it's okay to start working on something that you've only got a vague design or a vague idea for. Um, and in doing that, you're probably going to implement a bunch of things that you don't need. And in commercial development, that's a horrible idea because you need to be very careful about how you're spending your time and your resources and that sort of thing. But if you're making a game for yourself, then, you know, that is no longer the case and you can learn from the stuff that you end up throwing away you can learn why something does or something doesn't work which i think you know are, are equally important there's there's been tons and tons of features and things that i've built that i ended up throwing away but i still cherish them because i learned from them and maybe i can take those concepts to a future game my original plan for this game was, was dramatically different from where it ended up but i made a bunch of decisions about you know what felt good to me, what made sense to my gut, and because I arrived at something at that, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with what I've ended up at. All right, so you've got a bunch of tools, you've got a bunch of resources available to you. So this is where kind of the, the, the fun starts, right? For me, I like to draw and I like to doodle, um, but in Photoshop with pixel art. So with the tools and the resources I had, I started putting together different scenarios that I wanted my game to have and what they might look like. So I was thinking about what kind of emotion do I want to evoke? What kind of pressure do I want the player to be feeling? What kind of mood do I want them to be in? And I was just doodling around those concepts. And then once I had something that looked cool to me that I was like, yeah, I want to make that or I want to play that, I just worked backwards from there. So how would a player arrive at this scenario? What systems do they need to interact with? What should I build to make this happen? And then you start investigating each one of those features and you develop a plan of attack. You're probably familiar with this. Uh, you maybe heard it as like Scrum or Agile or something where you make a user story that has like, here's what I want them to experience. And then you step backwards from there. It's essentially the same thing. You just have a vision that you've established and you work backwards from there. So a lot of this advice doesn't really apply if you're making a game for an audience, which is something that I've been doing for a decade and a half. So. When there's no pressure, it stops being a chore and a stressor. It becomes an expression of creativity. I think that anyone who can make a game for themselves should make a game for themselves. Rogue's Gate was a, that game for me, and if other people like it, that's great. But the important thing is that I'm expressing myself creatively. I don't care if no one ever hears about it or if no one ever plays it, because I learned a lot about games and my own preferences in, in building it. So in that way, like building a game for yourself is a very therapeutic exercise because you learn about yourself. Um, and I wanna emphasize that anyone can do this. I know that it's kind of a cliche thing to say and you may have heard it before, but I truly and genuinely believe this. I had so many missing skills when I started this despite being a professional developer for a long time. Um, and I'm, I'm not blind to the fact that I had a lot of general game and computer knowledge to draw on to help me succeed. But I wanna stress that None of that is what mattered in the end. I used the same resources you can use, and I followed in a lot of the same steps that you can follow. Um, if you go on Rogue Basin, there's an amazing article called How to Write a Roguelike in 15 Steps. It was remarkably accurate and useful. Um, the only thing that was key to my success was not feeling discouraged and giving up. So no matter how irritating of a problem I ran into, 
with enough application of time and bashing my brain against a wall, like it eventually worked out. So I was making something for me on my schedule. I could take that time. So arbitrary limits are just that. Like don't give yourself arbitrary limits if you don't have to. Make something in your own time for you at your own pace. Another thing I want to mention is, you know, ask for help. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. It's free, usually. Uh, and if you ever get stuck on something, try rubber ducking. So explain the problem that you're facing to a rubber duck that you hold in your hand. Describe all of the variables, all of the things that you've tried to solve it, why they didn't work, why you think other solutions might work or might not work. And in bringing all that data together and formatting it so that you can communicate it to another person, you might arrive at a, at a fantastic solution or the solution that you needed before. And that rubber duck can be a friend that you ask for help. It doesn't have to be a physical rubber duck. Even if the person that you're talking to doesn't have the technical knowledge that you think they need to be able to offer valuable insight, just explaining your problem to that person can be hugely beneficial. Um, and I think one other thing that I want to say is everyone has a different journey to success. Don't feel like you're not capable of doing something like this because your journey looks different from all the others. I ignored a bunch of very common wisdom that you probably shouldn't ignore. For example, starting with something small that you can build upon. That's a great piece of advice that I ignored. But wisdom for everyone isn't going to be wisdom for you necessarily. I want to encourage you, you know, to make something for you at your own pace, answering only to yourself. And you might find that it it's wonderful and you love it and it makes you want to build games for other people after that. All right. Or you could just do this. And when your game is 90% done, restart development inside of Unreal 4 for no real reason other than you wanted to see what it was like. This is a project that I sunk a few months into uh, last year, taking my game that I'd already built in 2D and just throwing it inside of Unreal. It actually worked pretty great. Unreal is a fantastic engine. And because I already knew the game that I was trying to make, uh, it came together pretty quickly. Um, but at the same time, this was just a fun side experiment. And I think that I have more fun in the 2D version, so I'm going to focus on that for now. My original plan was, hey, what if I finished both games and then release them together as some sort of art project where I discovered a game from the 90s and then remastered it all by myself? I have eyes that are bigger than my stomach at times. All right, so thank you very much for listening to me yammer on. Let's take some questions from the audience. Great. Uh, wonderful talk. Um, Travis asks, if there's a way to play your game, is there a demo that's out that people can go play? So I feel horrible because my goal was originally get this thing out the door before the roguelike celebration, but unfortunately I did not hit that goal. So eventually, yes, you'll be able to play, but right now, no, it's not out there yet. Uh, I'm not kidding when I say like, it's like it's almost there. I just need to do some data entry and figuring out some equipment progression, but soon I promise it will be out there. I will not let this thing die. Cool. Well, we look forward to it. Um, someone else asks, uh, is there a good way to find digital assets, free digital assets, uh, freely licensed ones online? Just Googling you know, free assets doesn't always return the right thing. Mm -hmm. So when you Google for free assets, you're going to get a lot of um, garbage filtered in because like uh, Getty Images and a bunch of other uh, stock image places will be like, yeah, we have free stuff here. Come to our website. And then you go there, and it's actually a bunch of commercial stuff. Um, for me, it's that site that I mentioned in the presentation, opengamearch.org. Uh, it's kind of this central repo for free open source game art. So that's the main place that you should go. And then if you're just looking for art in general, go to like the Wikimedia Creative Commons section, look through there. You can filter by license, and then you can uh, filter like if you need GPL or Creative Commons, whatever you need. Uh, there's great tools for that. Open Game Art as well lets you filter by license. So if you're constrained by like a particular set of criteria, I would suggest going there and taking a look at what they have to offer. Cool. And then cool. Um, someone wanted to know, how do you feel about games that have purposely minimal lore, where the community has to sort of fill in the blanks about the backstory? I, I kind of love that concept. I mean, I, I'm pretty ambivalent about lore because like I've worked in D and D for a long time, which is like extremely lore heavy. So when I'm in, you know, my free time making stuff for me, I like to go pretty lore light because I, I, I just like having a lightweight set of lore that players can think about on their own. So I'm really a big fan of going lightweight lore, let the players figure it out on their own. 
And maybe, you know, they take it in a direction that you find interesting and you're like, yeah, okay, let's, let's incorporate that into the game. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Phil. Uh, is there a place in the social space you'll hang out to answer more questions? Uh, I might briefly be available in the main chat after this. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. It was a pleasure, and thanks, everybody, for attending the talk.